Aloha and welcome to Business in Hawaii with Reg Baker. We are a show that broadcasts every Thursday at 2 o'clock. We can be seen live on Livestream.com. And if you wanted to see the schedule for this show as well as the other shows that Think Tech Hawaii does, you can go to thinktechhawaii.com and that web uh, email address or, or website address is on the screen or was. Um, we are a show uh, talking about successful businesses in Hawaii, individuals that have made it despite the challenges involved. Uh, we are broadcasting from the downtown studio of Think Tech Hawaii in a Pioneer Plaza. Uh, in beautiful downtown Honolulu. Uh, with me today is Melly James, uh, who is uh, with Sultan Ventures and also heads up the Hawaii Venture Capital Association here in Hawaii. And she's got some very interesting stories to share with us today. So welcome, Melly. Glad you can make it. Thank you, Reg. Thanks for having me today. Uh, it's always a pleasure. Um, tell me a little bit about yourself. Now, you've um, you've seemed to have accomplished quite a bit in a short period of time. How, where, how did you get started? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so I was born and raised here in Honolulu. Uh, went away to, to college on the East Coast. Oh, really? Yeah. Cold country. Very cold mm. country. Upstate New York. Ooh. It really doesn't get much colder. I, I, I was, don't think. I was born in Jersey, so I understand okay. the cold weather. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I made my way over to San Francisco, uh, where I was for about 11 years before I moved back here. Um, and during that time, I, um, you know, kind of was following what I was, was supposed to be doing um, after college, which was some extension of my degree mm -hmm. um, and found that I wasn't very fulfilled. And what degree was that? That was, um, I went to Cornell University and got my degree in hotel administration. Oh, very good. Okay. And San Francisco is a good place for that. Yes, definitely. I was working at the San Jose Convention and Visitors Bureau, um, heading up their research and marketing departments. Mm. So, yes. That sounds exciting. <laughs> um, so I had what I guess we would call now a quarter life crisis. A quarter and, life crisis. Yes, not, okay. not quite mid, quarter life. <laughs> um, and quit my job, took about six months off, and then started my first company in oh. the mobile app world. In San Francisco? In San Francisco, yes. Very good. Yeah. Well, and that's a, a great place for the technology, too. Mm -hmm. So mobile app and technology, what a perfect fit. Yeah, so I had a, I had a great uh, bunch of years there. Um, started two companies in the mobile app world, one in the wine industry and one in the music industry. And then thought I should, um, you know, I really wanted to move home. Something was calling me to, to move back. I'd been gone for a very long time. Um, and I, because I worked for myself, I was able to kind of come back and forth a lot. Um, and was starting to see some kind of snippets of the startup entrepreneurial ecosystem here. And thought, you know, hey, I could really see trying to help build this uh, community and really help get it off the ground. And it was already doing, you know, a great job getting started, but thought that that would be a perfect place for me to kind of tap into while I moved, when I moved home. Very good. Yeah. And so you moved home and, and what, you just jumped right into it or was there a transition period? When I first moved home, I wasn't quite sure what I would do for, for work. Um, so I actually created my own job. I started a company here called Hawaii Apps and we built mobile apps for local businesses. Mm -hmm. And that was a really great kind of way for me to get my foot in the door and meet people and be in the industry. Um, and then I got recruited to uh, work with Blue Startups. Oh yeah, yeah. I've heard of them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I was with them when we uh, first launched the, the first cohort, um, was uh, with them through about five cohorts. And then in March of last year, I moved over to Sultan Ventures mm -hmm. and Accelerate UH, and that's where I am now. Very good. Yeah. So you've had a pretty exciting career. Yeah, it's been it's been incredibly um, fun and and really different, especially moving back about three and a half years ago. So it's been a it's been a great ride so far. Very good. So you you went to Cornell. You went through the process of learning. I guess did they call it Tim? Or they didn't that... call it Tim. They call it like ho hotel administration. H A D. I don't know. It's Something. Like, yeah. yeah. But it's, it's not it's Tim. Con it's it's kind of well. This visitor industry based hotel based, I guess. Well, they, I guess they call it hospitality because hospitality. it's actually, okay. there's a, quite a few degrees and one of the degrees is actually in entrepreneurship and real estate. Mm. Um, so a lot of consulting, finance, in addition to operations, HR, oh, interesting. all those types of things. Yeah. So I guess they do, does Cornell offer an entrepreneurial type of program? They do now. I, they didn't have one when I was there. Now that's one of the biggest majors. Um, so I'm actually now an entrepreneur in residence for Cornell University. So I fly back there once a semester for about three days 
um, and I teach a class and host office hours and meet with a lot of the students who are pursuing their entrepreneurial dreams or maybe have some ideas and I sit down with them and, and, and speak with them on campus. Good, and you help them flesh it out a little bit. And, oh yes, I, don't, yeah. I try not to crush any dreams, but I try to be constructive so uh, maybe their next idea will be better. Well, that, that's uh, very honorable of you, but, <laughs> but sometimes those ideas probably do need to be crushed. Yeah, a little, a little crushed, a little guided a little a, bit. Yeah. A douse of reality. <laughs> yeah. So is it fair to say that you're a, a professor then at Cornell University? No, I no. am not a professor. That, those, the, you, I can't even touch that level. I would say I'm, uh, I, I'm officially an entrepreneur in residence. It's, a, it's an official appointment with the school, oh. but um, I guess it would be a guest lecturer. Okay. All right, well, very good. Yeah, well, you've, you. you've accomplished quite a bit. That's exciting. And uh, so now you're back in Hawaii and you're, about, you're involved in, in different things. And, and can you give us a sense of what it is that you're doing now, I guess, on a day-to-day -day basis? Yeah, so uh, with Sultan Ventures, we're a boutique venture firm here based in Honolulu. Um, Omar and Tarek Sultan are, are two of uh, the people that I work very closely with there. Um, and we work with a lot of startups um, in, in local startups, um, we have a portfolio and we help companies anywhere from, you know, s small business to high growth um, and have, have actually just been a really big part of the startup paradise ecosystem that has been built in the last few years. Um, so that's my main role uh, with um, Accelerate UH as I'm the program manager, I'm sorry, the program director for Accelerate UH. Okay. So Accelerate UH is an entity that was started with Sultan Ventures and the University of Hawaii. And it's a venture accelerator that mentors invest in um, early stage startups that have any affiliation with the university. Okay, now we did talk a little bit during lunch about accelerators mm -hmm. and incubators and there is a distinction between the two. Can you just give us uh, what your definition of an incubator is and what your definition of a, an, an accelerator is? Yes, so, uh, so an incubator can be before and after an accelerator. What is clearly defined as an accelerator is when you have a distinct start and end point to a program. And that program, or those two dates, essentially your startup is supposed to accelerate while you're within that program mm -hmm. through resources, mentorship, um, investment, uh, and the program. That's kind of really the definition is having that specific start and end point. I think in terms of a, an incubator, you can have and be in an incubator before you go into an accelerator. Mm -hmm. And I think an incubator is a great kind of like office space um, that has incredible resources that allows um, the startups to access. Um, MIC is a great example of an incubator. We've had startups who MIC were in stands oh, for the Manoa Innovation Center, and that's on Woodlawn Drive right. in Deep Manoa. Um, uh, run it's with, a neat building. Yeah. It's, it's got a nice courtyard. It's got a couple stories high, and it's it's got a lot of opportunity for collaboration. Absolutely, and the HTDC, the High Technology Development Corporation, right. uh, does a great job managing that building and really helping with resources um, for the startups. Um, so for our program, we've accepted startups who have been in MIC, and then they some of them have actually gone back to MIC mm -hmm. uh, because it's a great environment to work in. Right now. Tell me, in, in Hawaii, is this a relatively new concept that we're working with here? Has it been around for a while? The incubator and accelerator process. Yeah, so the accelerators kind of came into existence um, starting in the beginning of 2013. Um, so it's been around for, I guess, now about three years. Uh, mm -hmm. We've had, I think throughout all the accelerators, I can't give an exact number, but I think over 100 companies have gone through at least one of the accelerator companies. Um, that are in existence here in Hawaii. So we have quite a few, um, some of them focused on um, transmedia, some on energy, uh, U Accelerate UH is focused on anything UH affiliated and that means that we're helping to grow the talent as well as the intellectual property coming out of UH. So for example, you could be someone who didn't even graduate but you're licensing IP coming out of the university to commercialize and bring and to market. IP is? Intellectual okay, property. Good. Thank you, <laughs> <laughs> So um, UH is actually one of the top third in the nation of research and development schools. Really? Yes. Oh. Um, they have an incredible, um, it's an incredible hub of, of research and intellectual property. And what we're doing is helping to take some of that um, and bring it to take it to market and commercialize it. So that's part of what the program does. The program also really works to develop that talent. Really
really works to develop that talent um, with it within the university and within Hawaii so that we can get that kind of workforce development and entrepreneurial development so these great ideas can have um, very strong, knowledgeable entrepreneurs who can take them to market and to really see those ideas through. You really need to have a strong talent base in order to make all this work, right? I mean, and that's part of what an incubator provides is, is access to some of this talent for the collaboration to happen. Absolutely, and that's something that we do at, at Sultan Ventures and Accelerate UH quite a bit, um, really focusing on that talent, um, and that can be through work experience, um, internship programs. Mm -hmm. um, we actually have a bill that is going through right now, or going, it's in its process right now, um, that will hopefully help to subsidize some of these startups so that they can pay interns. So it's great, it's a win-win. Mm -hmm. A lot of times these startups really desperately need help, but they can't afford to bring staff on their mm -hmm. very early stage. And a lot of our students, um, and even people just graduating from college would love that kind of hands-on work experience working with a startup, you know, so that they can get some of that knowledge when they are looking to start their own. Um, and what this does is really kind of create a win-win situation. It does, and it helps create some of that element of reality sometimes when people are thinking about an idea and they're, they're trying to explore ways of bringing it to market, getting them in an intern position to see how it all works. Mm -hmm. Uh, could really give them better insight into the process. Absolutely. That's very good. And Sultan uh, Ventures does similar type of, uh, you mentioned interns with them? or Yes. So we, actually, we have a very um, rigorous internship program. At any point in time, we have at least five to ten interns. Wow. Yes. Uh, we have a fellows program in the summer. Uh, this last summer, we had about three Cornell interns come in. Um, and we also, of course, some of them had Hawaii ties as well. And we have a ton of UH um, interns through PACE, through the Hawaii Student Entrepreneurs Club, mm -hmm, the Hogan mm -hmm. Fellows. Uh, we work with all of these programs um, to provide this type of experience that you really, uh, you really can't get otherwise without really getting in, really getting in and, and working with these startups and working with us and really seeing what it's like. You know, I, I've worked with startups myself and I've done some presentations for PACE and uh, it, it's, it's always an interesting crowd because there's so much enthusiasm, there's so much energy and creativity, um, and I can't imagine, it's got to be a challenge to try to channel some of that in the right direction because having 10 or 15 interns, I mean, they've got to have 100 ideas a day coming up. You know, that, that should be an interesting challenge. It is, it is, and what's great is, you know, we, we try to take a look at what skill sets they're bringing to the table. Obviously, we have things that we need to get done, but also looking at the areas that they're trying to grow and things that they're interested in so that we can pair them with the particular projects or startups mm -hmm. that, that makes, makes sense for them so as well. So there's a matching kind of process mm -hmm. that's taking place as well. Yeah. Very good. And so do some of these uh, interns and or companies kind of go into a next level? And, and what is the success rate? I mean, obviously they're there to be successful, but how many of them actually make it? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, we're very early in our, in our program. So we've been around for a year and a half. We've graduated three cohorts. So about 15 companies have gone through our program. Um, through those uh, graduates, we don't plan to, it's very early stage, so we don't plan to see an exit anytime soon in terms of this you know, IPO or an exit. Um, but what we do look at is the follow-on funding they're able to attract. So when we accept these companies into the Accelerate UH program, which by the way is all um, under the Vice President of Research and Innovation, Vasila Sermos, um, we basically have them go through the 16-week rigorous program. We provide some initial funding and then access to mentors and this rigorous program. Um, and at the end of it, of course, many of them are looking for follow-on funding. Mm -hmm. um, those, they have, uh, I think at this point, from our first two cohorts have raised over $7 million in follow-on wow. funding. And from our first two cohorts have um, made over seven or 800,000 in revenue, um, which is all, all really great things. And they're employing people, increasing their, increasing their employees. So this is all great stuff in terms of helping build that third sector in Hawaii, yeah. which is what we're really trying to do, the innovation sector, obviously, to complement the hospitality and military sectors that right. are already and here. And that's, that's part of that three-legged stool mm -hmm. that we're, we're missing that, that leg. It used to be agriculture, but that's kind of shaky right now. So this is a great third leg to the stool. Um, but let's hold that thought for a second. We're going to come back after a one-minute break, uh, and we're going to continue our conversation with Millie. We're going to be talking a little bit more about 
uh, venture capital and, and startups and, and companies that go through the process. Uh, and we're going to get into a little bit more details in about 60 seconds. Thanks. Aloha, my name is Carl Campagna. I'm the host of Think Tech Hawaii's Education Movers, Shakers, and Reformers. You can see our show every Wednesday at noon at 12 p.m. on thinktechhawaii.com as well as visiting YouTube and finding the link for the show there. The show is also aired on OC16. We look forward to seeing you on the show. Uh, we have many wonderful guests, uh, including Joan Husted, Corey Rosenley, where we talk about the very important issues of education for our keiki. We look forward to seeing you there. Mahalo. Hello, ha, how you doing? It's me, Angus McTech, wishing you to welcome and join us to see us on Hibachi Talk on Think Tech Hawaii. Join my co-hosts, Gordo the tech czar and Andrew the security guy every Friday from 1300 to 1345. We look forward to seeing you. We'll talk tech and we'll have some wee bit of fun. And remember, let your wing gang free wherever you be. Aloha. Welcome back. This is Reg Baker, Business in Hawaii, and I'm here with Melly James from Sultan Ventures and Hawaii Associ uh, Venture Capital Association. Uh, and we're talking a little bit about how people can come up with an idea, uh, go through a training process, and, and hopefully take it to a launch pad and have it take off. Uh, but we're going to talk a little bit about how this process works. What do you look for in a company when, when you go through the selection process? So the, the five things we look for are team, 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 product, or the idea, and then the market they're addressing. Okay, so team sounds pretty important. <laughs> yes. So the, yeah, the first three things are team, um, and that's incredibly important when you're looking at, at a startup, especially when it's so early on, um, early stage. So what we're looking for are people who are coachable. Mm. So, you know, that whole phrase, you don't know what you don't know, mm -hmm. and being, uh, being okay with that. Um, and also, if they don't feel like they need, they, 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 if they feel like they know everything, why are they going through the program, right? Mm -hmm. So it's, it needs to be a good fit for us as well as for them. Um, we also look for uh, talented entrepreneurs who have some industry experience. So at the end of the day, an investor is looking at why are you the people that are going to get this done, right? Why you? This idea may be good, but why are you going to be the one that's going to mm -hmm. accomplish this? Um, so that's really important. Uh, once we get through that, we, we take a look, of course, at the idea. And what's really great about uh, the Accelerate UH program is that we work very closely with the Office of Tech Transfer um, and looking at this intellectual property that is being born at the university and, and helping to get some of those ideas out to the market and commercialize so that uh, they can start seeing. Does the university keep a piece of this as they go through the process? Yes. Do they have their fingerprints on the IP after it's been developed? Yes, yes. Okay. So that, that's all, that all goes through the Office of Tech Transfer. Yeah. Okay. And so what's great is that um, in the last year, uh, Billy Richardson, who is now the director of OTED, um, we have all worked very closely with each other in order to make that process a lot more seamless so that we can um, really promote uh, more of these technologies spinning out from the university. Well, and that's a very positive thing. And I don't know if everybody appreciates it, but. Any time the university can get in and get their hands on to an intellectual property type of product that just takes off and makes a lot of money, mm -hmm. it's good for the entrepreneur, but it's also good for the university because some of that money comes back to help support other programs and other opportunities. Absolutely. So actually, um, Accelerate UH and what the University of Hawaii is doing is it's the first uh, of its kind in the nation for a public university to be taking an equity stake in its own technologies, mm -hmm. which is huge. You've seen this a lot in other universities like Stanford and other private universities, but for a public university, this is a big deal because it really is a win you know, for the state, for the university, and for, of course, the entrepreneur, and, and really helping to cultivate this, this ecosystem here um, in terms of being able to invest in its own technology and, and get it out the door and, and do great things with it. Well, it sounds like we've got a lot of interested stakeholders in this trying to really strengthen that third stool to make this work. Do you, do you see a lot of progress being made with this? Is this actually happening? We do. So we, I mean, as I mentioned, we have 15 companies that have graduated through our program, um, of which I'd say at least half, if not two-thirds, have, have been IP that that's has come a, through the university. That's yeah. a great success rate. Yeah, so I mean, the other third, as I was saying, is we are also cultivating the talent out of UH. So I said it has to be some affiliation. Mm. 
And that affiliation can be an alumni, a current student, or faculty that has a really interesting idea and that we'd like to help invest and mentor and help them pursue that idea. So it doesn't have to just be IP, intellectual property coming out of UH. It can be a current student with a really cool app idea. Very yeah. nice. All right, so now you've got a selection and you're building your next cohort. You know, what is the process? What do these people go through that will take them to, I guess, getting into an exit strategy? Mm -hmm. So what we do is it's a, it's a three-part uh, program, lean, build, and pitch. So it's kind of like uh, five weeks per, per, uh, per tier. Um, and the lean phase is really looking at the lean methodology. Um, and we teach them about specifically what is your value proposition? Customer discovery, get out of the building, go talk to the people that you think are gonna wanna buy your product. Don't come into a cave and work for six months and pop out and if you build it, they will come and say, okay, it's done, it's this perfect little baby I've got and everyone's gonna now buy it. Um, and of course you realize that if you had been speaking to people along the way and doing more customer discovery interviews, really creating something that people actually want. Mm -hmm. And also talking not to just friends and family who are always going to tell you what they think you want to hear. Oh, that's such a great idea. And of course, when it comes down to it, are, would you pay money for this? Actually, I mean, we're talking essentially about what market research on steroids. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it's really doing focus groups and hearing what people have to say about your idea. Yeah, and the point of it is that it's lean, right? So you're not spending all this money you're able to do that yourselves and we actually want the founders to do these interviews because a lot of times when you hear someone's opinion a potential customer you're able to kind of discern a little bit more kind of read in between the lines a little bit more than say you hired somebody to go oh can you just do a bunch of these interviews and let me know what they said right if you're actually doing them yourself you're able to start to really understand who this customer is and actually build something people want. So that's, that's a really key piece of, of what we teach in that first lean period. What are the things that you can do before you go into the build phase that are gonna arm you with the knowledge of actually building something that right. people want? Now, how many of these entrepreneurial wannabes are comfortable going out and talking to people about their ideas and their concepts. I mean, some, some of these guys have got to be really, really bright and they're kind of introverted mm -hmm. and, and they're not comfortable making that contact. Do you help them and coach them along the way? We do coach them in terms of, um, you know, helping them with market research as and also how, what kinds of questions should you be asking? Mm -hmm. So you can go out and ask a bunch of questions, but what are you ultimately trying to learn? So we do these kind of business model canvases uh, where they're really looking at, okay, what are the assumptions we're making right now? And how can we validate those assumptions? Um, so that's important. And I would say, yes, of course, there are a lot of the engineer types who may, may, be, or, may or may not be a little bit less comfortable um, um, you know, being more extroverted. Uh, but that is the challenge, right? And, and the, the worst thing would be it is to not go out and not speak to anybody. So we really urge them. We actually require that they do a certain number of interviews in order to meet certain milestones within the program. Well, and there's also the benefit of having the founder of the company or the creator of the idea get this feedback mm -hmm. and get a better appreciation of how it's being perceived by other people. Absolutely. And they can tweak it and, and refine it. Hopefully they've got an open mind to, to allow that to happen. Well, and that's why we do it first, right? So if you built something and then you start talking to people, you have a lot more on the line because you already spent months building something. Mm -hmm. And if someone then says, oh, I don't like it, and you've built this beautiful thing, it's a lot harder to make adjustments, even from a monetary standpoint, but also from an emotional standpoint, versus if I just drew it right now. So what do you think? And you're like, well, I kind of like it like this or like this, or this would I, would, I would buy it if it had this. I can then make some easy tweaks, right? So it may make sense to do the lean phase first. So that's kind of the first five weeks of the program. The second five weeks is the build. So now that you've learned all these things, so your customer discovery interviews, um, then you move into the build. Okay, actually build that product or make those adjustments. Some people come into our program on various kind of stages. They can even be from ideation where they had this amazing idea and it's a really, really strong team with industry knowledge and we think they can pull this off. Um, or it's a company that is pivoting They've already been around, um, they've, they're post-revenue. Mm. They've already even received some investment in the past. Um, 
kind of it's kind of all across the board. So the the build phase is really important, and then the final phase is the pitch phase. And a lot of people have come to our demo days. Um, we've been doing demo days for about four years now, and we invite anyone from the community who's interested in entrepreneurship and learning about all these local companies here to come to the demo days. Um, and they can go to uh, sultanventures.com or accelerateuh.com to, to find out about when those demo days are. Um, and, and so the pitch is really about not only are you able to pitch in front of you know, 300 people at a demo day and succinctly explain your value proposition and the problem you're solving. Um, and, and why you are the team to, to, to do this, right? There are very specific things you need to hit um, in terms of uh, uh, what you're trying to accomplish within those three to five minutes. But also, we do mock due diligence sessions with our teams where they're in front of a bunch of investors mm -hmm. and they're across the table doing a 10-minute pitch and answering about 20 minutes of, of question and answer because that's really the key here oh, when yeah. you're trying to raise money. No, it, there's nothing that's going to sharpen the concept more than having to defend it. You know, and that's it. So it sounds almost like a shark tank type of process. Well, it is because we would rather have them go through that practice with us than have them be trying out strategies when it really counts. Exactly. You know, practice makes perfect. Yeah. And it'd be better to practice with somebody that doesn't have a checkbook and get that out of your system and make the refinements and then go to the people with the checkbooks and, and really hit them with the best shot. Uh, that's good. Um, and so, you know, some product is constantly being, I guess, uh, enhanced. You know, it goes through a, a, a process of, you know, and I think of, say, the iPhone. I mean, and I know that Apple is a, a special category all by itself, but, but product will come out, it'll have some success, but it gets refined. And how does that fit into to your model? Is this something that we can, um, you know, come back and, and go through a process like this again for a, an enhanced version, or, or how, how does this yeah. work? How would that work? That's actually a great idea. I'm so glad you asked that. So we actually have two phases of our program. We have um, kind of a phase one and a phase two. So we've had multiple companies go through both and mm -hmm. at different times. So maybe they went through one and six months later they went through the second one. Um, and and we, we absolutely promote doing that. And that, the, a whole part of it is about iterating, is about refining, is about um, realizing like, hey, we thought this made sense and we went out there and we're hearing from our customers that they want something else. Actually, I have a great, a great example of that um, is a company that was in cohort one of Blue Startups I'm uh, sorry, co cohort two of Blue Starbucks back, back in 2013 called Happy Hour Pal, a husband and wife team who built this great uh, mobile platform for people looking for affordable happy hours, <laughs> which is great, right? And, and it was actually not just saying, oh, this place has a happy hour. It actually had the food menu. Some places their happy hour means they have a dollar off their well drinks. Who cares? You know, some places they have a fabulous half, half off of their poo-poo menu. And that's much better what you might be looking for versus another happy mm -hmm. hour. Mm -hmm. So they started with that. Really interesting team, great go-getters. Um, and a couple of years later, um, through some iterations of, of their product, uh, realized through talking to their customers and in their sales cycle that customers were really more interested in something slightly different, mm -hmm. in more of the big data around where people are going. Oh. And so they pivoted and created a company called Area Metrics. And they found incredible success. They've now raised, I think, 2.2 million. Don't quote me on that, but it's over 2 million. Um, they now, um, and they're, they, yeah, they raised their uh, next round of funding, and they're really doing well. But they've completely pivoted. But it was all based on really listening to their customers. Well, that, that's an interesting case study. I mean, we can come back to that for a second. But just out of curiosity, how long did it take them? What type of timeline are we talking about from the inception of the original mobile app to where it was refined and enhanced and they were able to raise over two million dollars. How? What's the reality? What's the timeline in something like that? So for them, I believe they were in existence for about two years before they entered Blue Startups and they pursued that um, for about, I'd say another two years before they started making slight adjustments. Okay. So we're now in 2016, so I think it's been about five years. All right, but that's not uncommon. No. I mean, it's something that people just got to anticipate and plan for. Um, we're going to have to go on another short break. 
Uh, we'll be back. This is uh, Reg Baker, business in Hawaii. I'm interviewing the, uh, the queen of venture capitalism here in Hawaii. Uh, and we'll be back with Melly uh, right after this 60 second break. Hi, I'm Chris Leatham, and I'd like to invite you to come and watch my show every Wednesday at 3. I'm interested in a variety of issues that have to do with politics and our local business economy. And I'd like to bring on guests who like to talk about everything from technology to social media to what we can be doing to improve our environment. And so I'd like to invite you every Wednesday at 3 to stay and watch my show here with Think Tech Hawaii. And I'll see you there. Aloha, you can join the Hawaii Farmer Series every Thursday from 4 to 5 on ThinkTech. And I'm your co-host Matthew Johnson here with Justine Espirito. And we are so thankful to have this show to use as a forum to get to know all the movers and shakers in agriculture in Hawaii and hear kind of their background in history as well as... Uh, their perspective on what they're doing and also the future for agriculture in Hawaii. So join us every Thursday. You can tweet in your own comments and suggestions and be a part of the conversation at Think Tech High. And we hope to see you every single Thursday. Welcome back. This is Reg Baker in Business in Hawaii. I'm here talking about venture capitalism in Hawaii. And Melly was just going to get into a discussion on guess the challenge is how this isn't an easy process this takes a lot of work to get this done so what's your thoughts on that yeah so we were just talking about um, you know that it's been about five or six years for happy hour pal that then turned into area metrics they just raised that money um, and looking at you know I think a lot of people have this idea that entrepreneurship and startups are sexy because you know they see the the Mark Zuckerberg's and and all of these uh, you know kind of the Ubers and Airbnb yes. and all of these. Throwing a billion here yeah. and a billion there. And that know. it just kind of happened overnight, you know, this. Uh, and uh, it really is not like that. I can't tell you how uh, how difficult it is. I, I, I went through it, and I remember a time where, um, you know, I went from having a, you know, a great job and decided to, to start my first company and, you know, really having to pull back the purse strings. Mm -hmm. And, and you, you hear about these, you know, these entrepreneurs are eating ramen and, and, and that actually really does happen. It's, um, you really have to be passionate and understand um, who you are as a person before you decide to jump into being an entrepreneur. Because at the end of the day, you have to kill what you eat. Mm -hmm. If you are an entrepreneur, there's no paycheck that comes at the, every two weeks. Um, and you really have to get gritty and, 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 and understand what you're trying to do and why and who you are and that you are, it's a high risk, high reward or maybe not a reward. Sometimes that reward comes much later. Mm -hmm. you know, and sometimes, not all the times, but sometimes there's going to be a couple of false starts in there too. And you know, not everybody is successful the first time out of the gate. Sometimes you got to come out of the gate two or three times before it starts to work. Absolutely. Just out of curiosity, of the, from your experience working with these individuals, how many of them, this is their first time, as opposed to how many of them have tried it before and mm -hmm. now they're, they're taking another shot? I would say um, it's about half and half, yeah. So, and, and a lot of times, when I first met them and they went through the program, they, it was their first time and now they're on their second company. So. Uh, I would say it's definitely about half and half, and, and um, that's what I tell a lot of entrepreneurs. It may not be your first idea, and that's okay. You can learn from that first idea, but make sure that if you fail, you fail forward, and that you are learning from those mistakes, and so the next time you're even that much better, and you've thought through some of those things so you don't, you don't, uh, you don't fall into those, uh, to those pits again. Right. Now, just out of curiosity, and I'm throwing a lot of trivia questions at you, but what's the average age of your typical person that goes through this? I mean, are they all young, full of energy, or, or what, what's the average age? What do you think? Or what's the range? I'd say the range is about 23 to, mostly, 23 to about 50. Okay. Yeah. So it's, it's a lot. It's a pretty big It's a pretty big range. People. And, and, I, and one of the reasons that I asked that question is that, and I know the times are different now, but I remember this company that, that's called McDonald's, and it was started by Ray Kroc. And he was, I think, in his 60s when he started McDonald's. 
Uh, and prior to that, he was selling milkshake machines. Wow. And so he had he'd been a serial entrepreneur, and he finally hit on the formula that worked. And of course, now it's history. But you know, you just the basic theme that I'm trying to get to is that you, you don't give up. I mean, you keep trying and, and try to make it work. Absolutely. Uh, yeah, for us, I mean, we, we have a lot of first-time entrepreneurs who are even current students right now at UH or at, um, you know, Scheidler or at um, Chaminade or HPU um, that, that, you know, that we've worked with in the past. Um, but we also have tenured professors, mm -hmm. you know, who mm -hmm. have developed some incredible IP at the university. Um, and yeah, this isn't their first rodeo. You know, this may be their fourth or fifth. Um, and it's, it's an incredible mindset to be in when you, when, I think when someone decides they want to be an entrepreneur or they get introduced to that, and this is what's really neat when you, when you actually work with, with children. When you start getting that entrepreneurial mindset, it's really about the world becomes your oyster and how you can see the world and how you're going to solve problems. You're no longer a victim of, oh, that's just how it is. You say, something's not right. How can we make that better? How can I solve that problem? And that's when it actually gets very exciting. Mm -hmm. I think the world's just a very exciting place. I'm always thinking about, like, well, how can we do that better? Well, it's almost like an attitude shift. Mm -hmm. I mean, you've got to be able to change your perspective on things and, and develop that can-do attitude. And if it doesn't work this way, I'm going to try it a different way and, and just keep going until you get the right formula. Mm -hmm. Very good. And, that's, and I'm like you. I enjoy working with those smaller mid-sized businesses that are maybe beyond the startup phase but they're still trying to get the formula right to, to make the uh, the type of business they want to have with the type of cash flow and profitability and it's it's fun to be in that environment and, and be nimble and quick and make decisions quickly what do you think for people that are going through this cohort with you and, and getting to the you know getting close to the the launch what is the biggest challenge that they face I mean I know we got capital issues. I know we got talent issues. I know we've got to have the right attitude. But from your experience, what do you think is the biggest challenge that people got to come to grasp with in order to make this all work? In Honolulu or in general? In, in Honolulu. In Honolulu, um, yeah, you're absolutely right. Uh, we do have you know capital challenges. We do have um, talent challenges. I think a lot of our startups, um, as they're looking to grow their teams even from um, an experienced managerial point of view, mm -hmm. to have someone who's been in a company that's had an exit, or even had someone who has been um, in, in an accountant or in, in marketing at another big company Just leaving. Just hold that thought. She said accountant, that's kind of like CPA. Go, <laughs> go ahead. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, you know, has had a particular role in another organ a larger organization mm -hmm. that said, you know what, I don't want to do this anymore. I want to go and join an early stage company. They don't have some of that talent and access. Um, I think another challenge we have here in Hawaii is, um, I guess we don't have any large tech companies or headquarters. Mm -hmm. You notice in a lot of big cities, there is a head, whether that's a Sprint headquarters, Target headquarters, some large corporation that underwrites a lot of these really big programs that can help spur innovation and development of sectors within the city. We don't have a lot of those types of companies here. We're seeing some, some really great people who are, you know, who are champions. I think um, American Savings Bank is doing some great work um, in our sector. Um, even looking at, though, um, not just from a financial standpoint, but being a beta customer. Mm -hmm. So looking at these companies saying, hey, why don't we engage this startup to, to help us solve this problem? Now that's interesting. As a matter of fact, if there was a big company that was trying to come into this state through maybe making an acquisition and that maybe they might be required in order to get the governor's blessing to have a little bit of a, an incubator, accelerator type of process that they could support some of these activities, I think that'd you know, be a great idea. that might be uh, yeah. you know, something that, that the governor might want to explore. Yeah, I think that's a very interesting <laughs> thought, Reg. <laughs> So uh, yeah, that's uh, but that would be fun. But and that's the type of money and and talent because this is, from what I understand, this is a pretty successful company. They've done well on the East Coast, the Southeast, mm -hmm. um, and they've got some good talent. And to be able to to use that talent and maybe some of the capital 
to help stimulate this third stool, this uh, third leg of the stool, you know, the, the innovation, you know, the sector, um, I think could be very positive for Hawaii and, and could make it be a little bit more receptive and, and get through some of the roadblocks. I think those are some really great thoughts, Reg. Mm, cool. <laughs> All right. Um, I think on a, another point, um, government has been um, a lot more supportive lately of um, really helping to spur certain bills that are going to help um, with the resources on the talent side as well as the capital side um, and just general resources and programs um, to really help spur more of the talent and, and ideas that are already here. Right. Do we have at the University of Hawaii, is there an entrepreneurial program over there? I mean, is it something that's uh, kind of like where they've got in other universities? Yes, they do have an entrepreneurial program. Um, and also PACE has been, has been there, of course, okay, the Pacific right. Asian Center Pace. for Entrepreneurship. Um, and that, that program is actually developing quite a bit um, at, within Scheidler as well. Good. Uh, so we, we actually have quite a few uh, interns, uh, you know, with, with, with those degrees, yeah. Excellent. So it sounds like we've got the, 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 the labor or the, uh, the maybe in some respects the talent that makes this happen. So no, this is exciting. Do, where do you see this headed? I mean, how, how soon will we be able to begin relying more on this third leg of the stool? Yeah, I think... Um, you know, there's been a lot of great momentum. We're at we're at this really great kind of um, I wouldn't call it a tipping point, but I guess I, I would call it that. Um, and and it, it does take quite a quite a bit of time in order to get a lot of the stakeholders um, on this on the same uh, page and have all of our interests aligned. Which I think we're really at that point now. Um, I think what's going to take is is getting um, having a big win. Let let's let's get a unicorn. All right. <laughs> Well, we got to put the word out. Yeah. You know, so we got to find somebody, and and you have a, a cohort coming up. Or are you in the process of putting one together now? Or yes, we are just starting our recruitment for our fourth cohort, which will begin um, in May. It'll be a summer cohort. The first time we're doing a summer cohort. Okay. Normally it's been spring and fall, but we're actually trying out the summer, which I think will be really really great. Um, and we'll be recruiting um, on campus as well as at our offices starting uh, this month. Very good. And how would they find out more information on this? Yeah, if they go to Accelerate UH, that's X L R, the number eight, UH dot com. They can find out more about our program as well as what we're looking for. And we have an open door policy at our office. So if you are an entrepreneur um, asking some ideas about where you can get resources to further flesh out your idea, please email us, uh, call us. Come in, we will sit down with you and help you get a lay of the land. And even if you're looking for a founder, a co-founder, we do a lot of founder dating. So we match founder, people up. Founder dating. Founder dating. Mm -hmm. We do matching up. Yep. Yep. Very good. Uh, and there's a website, and I think it was just on the, uh, the, the screen, but there's the website right there, I think, that uh, they can go to to find out more information about the, uh, the cohort. Very I have good. one last thing sure, before absolutely. you have one last Please. thing. Um, the Hawaii Venture Capital Association is hosting our 16th annual Deal and Entrepreneur of the Year Awards Gala on February wow. 25th at Wiley Country Club. Wow, and it's nice. a huge celebration of the innovation leaders and big successes of last year. And if anyone is interested in learning more about what's going on and wants their kids or currently wants to meet other entrepreneurs doing great things, that it would be the place to do it. Very good. And where would they go to find out more information on this? They would go to hvca.org. Okay. And then uh, they, they just go in there, sign up, register. There's probably going to be a little seat charge or something. Mm -hmm. And then they, they show up and, and this would be an opportunity for them. Are there going to be like presentations or is there going to be, it's an awards banquet? Of it's an awards banquet. So there'll be three finalists per category. We have eight categories which range from Tech Entrepreneur of the Year, Clean Tech, uh, Social Impact, Student Entrepreneur, across the board, um, and we'll have quite a few of those that we'll talk about the, their accomplishments um, and, and, and giving out the awards. Yeah, well, I wish we had more time to, to spend and talk, but we have reached the end of it. In fact, I'm getting the, the heads up that we've gone over our time. So we need to wrap up, but this is uh, Reg Baker, Business in Hawaii. We air every Thursday at 2 o'clock, and we talk about positive stories about business in Hawaii. I hope to see you next week. Thank you, and aloha.